Hi, I'm Mary Wong. Welcome to Fertility Live. And this is live post number 110. And I'm thrilled to have Dr. Paul Turk to be with us today. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, sperm. Because guess what, guys? For those of you who are trying to conceive, male, 50% of the equation. But we got to look. And for some reason, anytime you go to the fertility clinic, I feel like we don't talk about that. So I have an expert here, and Paul is, Dr. Tur is the man to talk to <laughs> about this. So before we start, thanks for being here, by the way, taking the time out. Can you hear me? Barely. How really? are you? Yeah, it's, I can hear you. It just speaks slowly, but yes, thank you for having me. Okay, so let me just introduce you properly. Okay. So Dr. Turek is a male reproductive health expert and is founder of the Turek Clinics, leading clinics for men worldwide. He is a former endowed chair professor at the University of California, San Francisco. As a master medical surgeon, he has popularized no scalpel vasectomy. How awesome is that? And has <laughs> among the highest published vasectomy reversal success rates. He received a prestigious National Institutes of Health, which is NIH grant, and advises tech and biotech firms. He's on the board of several nonprofits, is an advisor to the NIH, and the Center for Disease Control and Protection, CDC. And so um, at the end, I'll type in the Turek dot com for you that you can check them out for more. I know you've got some really great blogs and um, information on anything to deal with the male sperm and men in general. So let's get on. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you and for being Mary, you did know that I'm faculty at Yosan University in Los Angeles, the okay. traditional Chinese medicine university. Well, that's awesome. I did know that. But you know, I have to tell I've you. gone to the other side. I love it. Yay. So for those of you that have been, haven't um, actually tuned in before, I am a doctor of Chinese medicine. <laughs> so you might not know that. And what I do is I help people, whether they're trying naturally to conceive or in conjunction or as an integrated part of the Western medical law. So, you know, I've worked with someone like Dr. Turek, but of course you're all the way in California. So physically, no, we're not working together. <laughs> ah, that's okay. So um, let's get on with the interview. Because male is 50% of the equation, how do you evaluate males for infertility? So the first thing is they should get an evaluation. Men should get an evaluation. So the latest data in America was from a consortium with Canada and America that was reported that of couples who are infertile who are going to IVF, only 20% of the men had an evaluation. So they all had a sperm count done, but they didn't have an evaluation. And that's recommended by the ASRM, our national um, society, because infertility is a disease. So that's very relevant here. So it's a disease that's shared sort of uh, between two people. And so each should get an evaluation. Typically in America and North America, women get an evaluation, which involves more, a lot of things, blood tests, ultrasounds, uh, timing of their cycle, et cetera, health history. Men typically get a semen analysis. So what men should be getting in all cases of infertility well before IVF is a history, a physical, a semen analysis, and blood work if necessary. The most important of these is the history. Uh, second, I would put the physical, and third, I would put the semen analysis. Because if the semen analysis is abnormal, you could still be fertile. And unless it's zero, it has no predictive value for fertility. So it's quite essential. And it's very easy to do. In my practice, we do it in one visit. So typically, a man might contact me, we'll get things set up, we'll have everything done, and that visit is his one and only visit because it's hard to really get men out of the forest and into the office. 
Totally. So if a man is watching right now, what's the one thing that you can say to him that will make him come to see you? Because it's true. Listen, I have women that come in and look through their whole profile and um, she's like totally taboo. And I'm like, how about you? And she's like, ah, no, he's not going to tell me. Yeah. So basically think about half the problem being male. So although you may think you're normal, you may not be. In other words, you could be healthy and you could be this and you could be that, and you think you're doing everything right, but you still may have a problem. So the number really is that half of infertility has a male related factor. So it really behooves you to do it and do it for her or your partner. Just do it for them if you're not doing it for yourself. And second is even if you have a normal semen analysis and you feel healthy, there's still at least a 25% chance that you're the cause of the unexplained infertility. So that would be unexplained if everyone's normal and you're not conceiving. There's still at least a 25% chance and it could be higher as the field of epigenetics grows. So you're a chunk of the issue as a guy and you really, it really should do it. It's, the other reason to do it is if there is a problem, we can often fix it. And fixing problems in men is more cost effective than anything you do with technology. So fixing women or fixing men is usually the cheapest way to get the kid or the family. So the third reason is we could find something that is medically important. So brain tumors, diabetes, testis cancer, other things, um, hormonal abnormalities, all that stuff can be tracked by a simple evaluation. So we're really good at it. The reason why we do that is because rarely do you see men, young men in the doctor's office. So my attitude is get whatever you can out of that visit. So if you have other issues, I, you know, I try to treat everything because men are typically disengaged and you want to, they want to know that you're there, that you're on their side and you're at, you know, you're out to help them. But, you know, if you're unhealthy, that could be the reason for a low sperm count and any habits like hot tubs or smoking or things like that. Or you could simply have a varicocele, which is a vein in the scrotum that you never knew about. Typically, if you have an infection, it shows up as a symptom. So that's not usually very common, but subtle things can show up on the semen analysis too. So there's everyday things that you can find that you'd never think about otherwise, because you're only thinking about things if they hurt you as a guy or if they're life-threatening. And then you'll do something about it. But I want to get you sooner than that when you could be making changes. And the changes I would recommend are going to be lifestyle changes if you can, because those have the most impact, I think, of healthy eating and healthy weight loss and weight loss and exercise and of course sleep. So then let me ask you this. What if on the semen analysis it looks normal? Mm -hmm. But you know, you can't see chromosomally if it's normal or not. What do you say to that? So that would be unexplained. If she's normal and he's normal, then it would be unexplained. And in cases of unexplained infertility, uh, lots of times you have to dive really deep into lifestyle issues because things can affect sperm that aren't quite enough to affect the sperm count, but can affect it in other ways. So we do a deeper dive for sperm. Typically now that would involve a DNA fragmentation rate to look at the quality of the DNA in the sperm and it could have involved and may involve soon again ep the epigenetic profile of sperm, but that testing isn't available at the moment. But I can usually find something if, on, on a simple evaluation, but it involves a really good history and a good physical exam. So the classic for me is a varicocele. Unexplained infertility, maybe normal semen analysis. You do an exam, a man has a, a bag of veins in his scrotum on the left side, He's athletic in the past. He never knew about it. It never hurt him. And you check his sperm DNA fragmentation and it's high. That means it's hard to get pregnant because she's going to look at the sperm DNA, not just the sperm number. And she's going to say, this isn't good enough and not get pregnant with it. And you can fix that. You can fix yeah. yeah absolutely. So you've got a correctable lesion right there. Okay. That's great. So I hope you're men watching. So it's super practical. It's super practical. Yeah. yeah. So now we mentioned, okay, so you said what Mercosil was. We mentioned epigenetics. So describe what epigenetics to those who 
don't know what that is. Yeah, so it's an interesting evolution. To just go back to the patient who normal semen analysis, I'm okay, not conceiving, she's okay. So the you know the move there is the technology, IUI, IVF, inseminations, IVF, in vitro. But I'd like to see that guy first. Uh, and I have a valuation that I trademark called maybe it's him. And <laughs> it's very simple. I mean, it's a targeted evaluation of a guy who is you know, either unexplained or failed IUI or failed IVF. And the data I sort of collected is that if it's just trying at home without success in that situation, the chance of that there's a significant male factor is about 25%. However, if it's unexplained and you fail IVF, it's probably 50 to 75% male factor. So it becomes more important and you're starting to throw some serious money at the baby at this point. So it really makes sense to think about evaluating him. Maybe it's him. It's really simple. If you go online, search it, you'll see maybe it's him. And you can read about it on the turretclinic.com. But love it. that evaluation used to be just a semen analysis and a morphology and a really good history and a physical. And sometimes you can pick things up, but then DNA fragmentation came around. And so that's ordered, which is a semen analysis essentially. And then there's other little ones that go with it. There was sperm penetration assay and a bunch of things with sperm, but um, morphology, you can, the shape of the sperm can give you lots of clues about performance sometimes. And then the, then every, so genetics came through, which was explaining lots of stuff, but not everything. And then, so we're here with DNA fragmentation and we're here with genetics and we're checking things out. And we're not finding anything. Then about five years ago, the field of epigenetics exploded with a, a paper that I was helping out with, but not an author of, but started a company but called Episona. And the paper did this. It took couples with that situation with normal semen analysis and they go through IVF and she's young and she's normal by all standards. And they go through IVF and they divide the couples into couples who make good embryos and bad embryos. And 80% of the embryos had to be one or the other. And they looked at the sperm epigenetic profile of these couples and found that they were vastly different between the good embryo developers and the bad embryo developers. And that sort of, that was published in Fertility and Sterility and led to the idea that there can be very subtle things in the way sperm DNA is marked. So these aren't chromosomal issues. These aren't genetic mutations. These are marks on the DNA that make your nose a nose and your ear an ear, despite the fact that the cells are all similar. So it's a really interesting new field um, and it's very exciting and it's explaining a whole lot of what was unexplained in the past. And I was thinking as I entered the field, you know, I'm not the first guy in the field, but why isn't, why aren't we able to explain more of male infertility? Well, the answer is we didn't have the tools and now we're finding the tools. And probably the most relevant statement I'm gonna make to you, Mary, is that what we're learning is the deeper we go into the science of male infertility, the more important lifestyle, nutrition, exercise, stress relief, and all the things that you do that are Eastern matter. So here I am, a Western full professor endowed chair, now an Eastern faculty member, because I believe that what matters most is lifestyle. And that's what the epigenetics is gonna show. So let me give you an example of epigenetics. So Darwin was a geneticist evolution, right? He said, giraffes have long necks because well, because their mom or dad had a longer neck and they passed the gene down and the kid has a longer neck and that is a survival advantage because you can eat more leaves and you can survive better. So that's how giraffe got, giraffes got long necks. And there was another guy around that time, 65 years old, named Lamarck. And Lamarckian theory said giraffes have long necks because they spend their whole lives reaching so high that they develop the characteristics and being able to reach higher. And so they inherit acquired characteristics. Darwin didn't believe in that. Darwin knew about Lamarck. So Darwin is describing Mendelian genetic, classic genetics, and Lamarck is describing epigenetics. Yeah. So he's become hot right now because 175 years ago, he was describing epigenetics. It's the changes of daily life and the effect of those changes on the genes and their expression. It doesn't alter them. It doesn't mutate them. It just alters their expression. 
and that leads to changes in behavior and changes in attributes. So if you take obese men, and this study just got published, it's in the blog, it's called turekunmenshealth.com. If you take obese men and you give them gastric banding surgery and you operate and they lose massive amounts of weight and become normal weight, and you look at their sperm before they do it and a year after they do it, after the weight loss, they look different. Their epigenetic patterns are different and they're different in very specific ways. And that's heritable. So what, you, what you're passing on is goes to the next generation. It's just wild. But I would call this microevolution. This is the daily evolution that we go through. We are not developing bigger ears and you know longer fingers. We're developing sperm, which is all about sperm and reproduction and all that stuff. And you know, God or Darwin is monstrously trying to protect our fertility. So although there's a low sperm count issue, we're not going extinct. Promise. Right. But yes, um, just mentioned that there's the whole thing about gosh, like our sperm count is going lower, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's an epidemiologic, it's, it's, it's a statistical analysis, basically, of 180 studies over 50 years showing that our sperm counts drop by about 40%. Only in Europe and America, not in South America, not in other, not in Africa, just in certain places. So, you know, if you want to stay, if you want to prevent the species from being extinct, you got to move to Africa. So there you go. But, <laughs> um, and it's basically old data that was recrunched with new statistical analyses called meta regression analyses. Very fancy, too too complicated for me. Um, but I say, so what? You know, if you want to read my opinion, it's in the New York Times. It was highlighted about sperm counts about two months ago. Um, so just Turk, search Turek New York Times, and you'll see my comments. And I basically said, you know, so what? So our counts are lower. They're still normal. And maybe we're more fertile. Maybe women don't need 60 million sperm. Now they need 20 million sperm. Maybe that's fine. I mean, we're clearly women are achieving menarche sooner than they used to. Right? It used to be 13, 14, 12, 11, 10. And maybe as a species, because we control our environments and we're not cavemen, we, we have, we're more fertile than ever. Because the uh, bottom line for me is that you can say whatever you want about sperm counts and I haven't seen any trends in my practice, but the fact is our fecundity, which is our potential to conceive, has never been demonstrated to be different. And I know that because we met at the NIH for a study section and published a paper on it saying, what's the evidence that human fecundity, which is the fertility potential, not the actual fertility, but the potential is changed. You can't use birth rates because birth rates depend on socioeconomics. Women are waiting. So you can explain birth rate data in developed countries simply by postponing family building and control of contraception. But, uh, but fecundity isn't really changed. So I brought that argument up. And the last one was uh, also in a blog because they didn't want to hear all of it, was if you look at species that are close to us like apes or monkeys, and if you take, if you take monkeys, monkeys are po polyamorous or polygamous. So a female monkey will mate with several males. So that's a comp yep, competitive environment. She shops around, he's good tonight, he's good the other night, so they're polygamous. And so if you look at sperm counts in monkeys, they're a billion sperm in the semen. We have 60 million, they have a billion, and they look great, right? Lots of competition. And then you go to gorillas or orangutans, bigger. They have harems, there's no competition. One male, several females, you know, they have alpha males, very different. Their sperm counts, 20 million. Human sperm counts, 20 million. Is our society more like an ape or more like a monkey? I don't know, it depends where you live. But I would say that we have much more control over environments. We're pretty much monogamous for the most part. So the selection pressures and evolutionary drive is down. I mean, there's no pressure. 20 is all you need. You, you know, you're not competing with another another 10 guys with a billion sperm. So it makes a lot of sense to me that this is not a concerning trend. But it also, you know, I, I do believe that we were cavemen and now we're industrial, industrial society. So things have changed. And if you ask me what I worry about, I worry about paternal age. I worry about autism. I worry about the things that happen as men 
have kids when they're older. That's the thing that concerns me a lot. So men and women. Men and. So you're me. looking at the, so in the you know, autism and all that you're naming, you're looking at it from a standpoint of men and women aging, not just women. Right. Yeah. Right. But but there are pater specific paternal age issues of um, psychiatric disease and offspring that is associated yeah. with paternal age. And so yeah. those are typically seen after age 40, 50 and get really quite impressive at 70, seven year old dads. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the autism story alone is probably a big chunk of that is paternal age related. And that's an interesting I just wrote a blog for WebMD about this, so that's the other new thing. I'm now a writer for WebMD, but um, it's it's a new problem. So being an older dad, it's only been around for 50 years because older dads didn't exist 50 years ago, maybe 100 years ago. The mean age of an American in 1910 was 38 years. The mean age of an American was about 55 and 50 and maybe 70 in 1960 or 70. So literally you didn't have older dads until about 50 years ago. Right. So the whole problem is new because we're living longer. Okay. Fascinating. So it is really fascinating. But for those that are trying to conceive that are at that age, I'm not here to make them get depressed. So <laughs> let's talk, carry on, shall we? Okay. Um, now, how about when there's a man, there's like no ejaculated sperm? What do you do with that? And how do you evaluate them? So, so some men have semen that has no sperm in it. And you can't tell grossly by looking at it, but it's called azospermia. It's Greek, empty. Um, and that is either, so think of that as an, is your, there's a car and you can't tell if it's running or not because it's quiet but you stand behind it and the exhaust, there's no exhaust coming out. So you don't know whether the engine's running and the exhaust is blocked or whether the engine's not running, the exhaust is open. So as a microsurgeon in urology, I love exhaust systems. I'm a Midas man. Uh, I love rebuilding them. They're fun, you reconstruct them and you can bring sperm back, you get the exhaust back. And, and if the problems, the engine, uh, we're not quite as good at that fixing that, but sometimes it can be running a little bit and that's good enough. So typically the first thing you do is you have to look at the engine, you have to open the hood. So something has to be done to figure out whether there's sperm production going on in the testicle. And that's usually done with a biopsy classically, which is a cut. I don't do those, but I do mapping, which is I developed 20 years ago. So it's called fine elaboration mapping. It's non-surgical, it's in the office, takes an hour. And it tells you exactly what's going on in the testicle. Is it blocked? Is it is it running normally or not? And then if it is running normally, you can go after the exhaust with surgery and reconstruct it. If it's not running normally, you're kind of committing them to IVF with sperm from the testicle because the other fact about azospermia is that men make more sperm than they ejaculate. So there can be a reservoir of sperm in the in the ejac in the testicle that's not making it out sort of like a bucket, it has to fill up before it spills over. Or a cup of coffee where you fill it a little bit and you, you wag it and it doesn't spill over. But if you look inside, there's coffee in it. So we can take advantage of that. In fact, most men who are zero, who aren't making normal amounts of sperm will be making some on the testicle. And then the third fact is that sperm can be used with IVF very successfully without much difference in other sperm. It really is almost identical. A lot of the times, the, the patients who aren't making a lot of sperm and none in the ejaculate are genetic. And a lot of the guys and some of the men who have blockages have genetic blockages. So it's really important to evaluate these men for genetic risk because if they do have a kid and IVF is high tech and it can bypass natural selection, you might be passing things on. And the worrisome thing for a blockage is cystic fibrosis in the kid and the worrisome thing for the not blockage situation is chromosomal abnormalities that cause miscarriages. And those miscarriages at IVF become very expensive miscarriages. And yes. they're all. So, so then in general, what percentage would you say um, of failed IVF is due to male sperm? 
So I would say depends, but probably in the range of 25 to 50 percent. So this is an interesting story. You go through IVF, no one's got any issues, and it fails. Well, the question is what fails? So what part of it didn't work? So there's fertilization, the first thing that happens. Did they meet and did they mix? Did they develop into early embryos? Did the early embryos develop into later embryos because they're running them in a dish for a while? Or did it just not get pregnant or was there a miscarriage? So, so there are certain steps that we thought, we thought initially that sperm just drove fertilization. So if you fertilize fine, sperm was fine. So 20 years ago, we would say unexplained IVF failure, 5% of its sperm. But now we know more. We know that actually you can put anything in an egg and it'll fertilize. You can put a piece of dust in there. So, so pretty much it's sperm independent. There can be rare situations where sperm is so deficient that it won't fertilize, but typically it's not the issue. So a poor fertilization rate is typically not a sperm problem. Early embryo development is typically, a, could be a sperm problem from DNA fragmentation where the egg is assessing the quality of the DNA early on when they're meeting, the egg asks the sperm to undress its DNA and then looks at it thoroughly with 3,500 mismatch repair genes. And it tries to fix the problems because all guys have problems. And we, it introduces, you know, it fixes those problems. And then it goes forward or not. It decides, okay, can I do it or not? The egg makes the decision, executive decision, do we go forward? That's all occurring between sort of days two, four, five in the embryo in a dish. So I call it dissolving embryo syndrome when, you know, it starts out really strong and then it just peters out and you get nothing. And that's a great patient for a maybe it's him evaluation. Um, but I would say there's a chunk of male in that one. And that could be DNA fragmentation. That could be epigenetic and a lot of things. And you can say, so doc, all this epigenetics, what are you going to do to treat it? Well, there's some good technology coming out. There's now sperm selection techniques. So think about it. IVF, mix the sperm and eggs in a dish, and you get the best sperm wins. It's not much of a fight because they don't have to go very far. You started doing ICSI, which everyone's doing, 70%, thinking that fertilization rates would be higher. And it's done for lots of reasons, older maternal age, poor sperm morphology. And it's an embryologist picking the sperm. You know, maybe they have a college degree, maybe they don't. They're probably drinking coffee in the morning, and they look at the sperm and they say, I like the sperm. And that's the sperm that goes into the egg. But is that like God or Darwin? Is that, is that a rational way to choose sperm? I've always wondered. And so recently I've been a part of um, one of these. There's PIXI, physiologic ICSI. ICSI is the single sperm injection where you make the sperm do some work and you have the sperm bind to something like it would bind to an eggshell. It's a fake eggshell. And then you grab that sperm that's actually done the work that a normal sperm would do. And you look at that sperm and it's better. So it, it performs better. It has better DNA fragmentation. It has better chromosomes. It typically looks better because it's actually done something. It's, it's differentiated itself from the other sperm other than being pretty and moving well. And the second newer technology, just FDA approved, it's called Zymot fertility chip, terrible name, Z-Y-M-O-T for zygote motility. No idea why, but anyway, it's making the sperm do a different form of work where it acts to run a path through a chip. So you drop it on a chip, 20 minutes later, you pick it up at the other end. The sperm that make it have done some work. Wow. Actually, Look the work that. they've done is simulating the cervical path. Yeah. So when it fertile, you know, when the sperm gets to the egg, it has to go to the cervix and it has microchannels. So this chip kind of imitates the microchannels of the cervix. And if you look at those sperm, same thing, better DNA you know, less fragmented, better chromosomes. Epigenetically, we have initial data showing that it's improved. So there actually may be solutions to these problems. It failed IVF. Maybe it's him. Well, you know, thank you for saying this, because I'll tell you, so many women that go through IVF, and when it fails, the automatic go-to thing is they blame themselves. It's not failed, it's I failed, right? Right. If, if responsible themselves and it's like no it, there's so many factors involved and right. many many factors in them. so thank That's you true. for addressing that yeah so i'm all over this technology i think it's great and so some 
even I'll even recommend it for couples who are women who have older maternal age, above 38, no apparent problems, going to IVF before they fail, and just saying, you need the best sperm you can give her. Totally. Right? You just need the best sperm because her bar is pretty high to proceed at IVF and to avoid, you know, dissolving embryo syndrome. So the early data out of Cornell, that, that Palermo, Dr. Palermo runs the lab there in Venedixi. He's using it on his uh, older women, 40, 42, aneuploid embryos out of IVF on biopsy, the, you know, the, the hardest cases. And he's seeing more euploid embryos by about 25, 30% just by doing a different sperm selection technique. And that, you know, that's already a case where you know there's a female factor and all you're trying to do is get is get the best parameters, the best sperm. So I think it's got potential in a lot of areas, especially older maternal age cases, which are higher risk for poor embryo development. But not everybody so, is doing this right now, right? So what is it called again so people can look that up? So it's just FDA approved and it's called Zymot, Z-Y-M-O-T, Fertility chip. It's a microfluidic chip. I think it's it, I think it's zymotfertility.com, um, and it's based on fluid physics from a Stanford professor who's just dreamy. He's just he's so nerdy and so fun. And I mean, I don't know any fluid physicist who loves sperm like this guy. And I was like, why do you like sperm so much? He was publishing in physics journals on the microfluidics of propelling bodies, and he used sperm because they have motors. And I look at this stuff in the physics journals, like, what is this guy doing? He needs to be in our field. <laughs> so he came out from a completely different angle. It's very cool. That is very cool. Okay, so it's my mind, guys. Should all look it up? I don't know if yeah. I'm that, but certainly I guess you can in the States. So yeah, I'd watch it. Yeah, okay, I'll be watching. Um, so in terms of reliability tests, how reliable is it? DNA fragmentation test, um, sperm analyses. So typically sperm analyses are not reliable. Um, I've been quoted in the literature as calling them a blunt instrument for fertility. And we talked about in the beginning of it, unless it's zero, it's really not a good predictor of male fertility at all. Um, and, you know, the evaluation is kind of why it's too much variability. So. I would say that the semen analysis was never meant to be counted. So people think it's a lab test like a glucose, but a glucose is very precise and it's monitored very precisely. Semen analysis is like ordering stars in the universe. It's very different. It's not as you know tightly constrained. It has tons of variation. So there's individual variation, there's ejaculatory variation, there's technical variation, there's seasonal variation. Ugh, there's like 10 of them, all the biases that, that account. So to get two samples from the same guy within 10% of each other is like a miracle. And wow. so you're dealing with a lot of fluidity in the sample, even the quality of the ejaculate. I mean, a, yeah. a masturbated semen sample isn't as good as a naturally procured one with sex because foreplay is different, right? Absolutely. It's going to be a, a, not as good a sample when someone's knocking at the door wanting to get into the bathroom. <laughs> I love all your analogies. It's awesome. <laughs> Keep it yeah, real, everybody. right, Mary? Keep it real. <laughs> um, here's a question here. Who prescribes a DNA fragmentation fertility doctor MD? I'll let you answer that. So it's done by prescription. So, so DNA, like a semen analysis, these are all doctor-ordered things. Um, and so one of the doctors can do it and there's lots of places to do it. That's kind of a general thing. I have to say though, it's not been recommended for the initial evaluation by our national society. So it's not part of the initial evaluation. I use it for the deep dive when maybe it's him, when you're going for a more, a more, a more defined look, a more probe, probe deeper to in men. Yeah. So in, in Canada, it's certainly not through your uh, general practitioner. It has to be through fertility doctor or urologist. Yeah, they won't know how to interpret it, probably, a general practitioner. No, uh, not at all. They probably don't even exist. I'm just saying too much now, but it's true. Sometimes they don't even, okay, I'm not gonna do it. Never mind. Just go to a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, any th other words of wisdom that you would add in? What's your final piece of advice you have for women and couples out there? I think the, the most important thing is to get the guy seen by somebody. I mean, I really don't like picking up two testis cancers a year after couples have failed IVF because they wondered why he didn't get evaluated and I find cancer because I worry if they did get pregnant and he would probably not be picked up for three or four years. So we find things and fertility is a sign of health. And the mom, the most important thing is we now know that a man's fertility is a biomarker of his health. It's a new concept. And we don't know exactly what the biomarker is. Is it the semen analysis? Is it the testosterone level? But it looks like it's a big reflection on the current health of the patient and the future health. And to me, this is a huge opportunity because even the semen analysis can be helpful. We, we sort of spearheaded this field in 2009 by publishing a paper, a big epidemiologic paper and 65,000 couples in California who were infertile. And we showed that in men with low sperm counts, if you follow their health with California cancer registries, they have more testis cancer and more prostate cancer later in life than men with normal semen analyses and no male factor. So that was the first hint. And that, that study was done because of a basic science study showing that if you mess with DNA mismatch repair genes in mice, mm -hmm. you get cancer and infertility. And I looked at those mice models and I said, we got guys who look like this too. And then I studied the men. Actually we studied infertile men first and found that they had evidence of mismatch repair problems. So then we're finding the same phenomenon in humans as in mice. And then I said, well, mice are getting cancer. Are humans getting cancer? And our, it was an epidemiologic study, so it's not causal, but it basically says yes, and it's been confirmed since around the world. So it's led to the NIH giving out grants to look at this. And since then, it's come a long way. So the cancer data has been confirmed. And now we know that men who are infertile, while they're infertile, have more disease burden than men who don't. They're, they're heavier, they have more diabetes, they more have blood pressure, more cholesterol issues. They're not sicker, they just have more, more diseases at the time they're infertile. And we know more. We know that men who are infertile have higher rates of heart disease as they get older, which is very concerning. And that may be cholesterol and stuff like that, but they're not as healthy going forward. And finally, uh, my, Michael Eisenberg at Stanford, who was how I trained, is coming out with data showing that men who are infertile don't live as long, and that's confirming some of the Northern European studies as men who are infertile. But that's a that's a bit of a reach because you could be infertile, depressed, and commit suicide. So there can be lots of other things going on with infertile men that have nothing to do with lifespan and normal lifespan. Well, and then I mean, earlier there's genetic factors, but if you improve your parameters, then you can improve your likelihood of survival. Right. So, and, and it's a, it's a, it's a foot in the door to their health. Exactly. So it's the canary in the coal mine. So we may be able to say, oh, your sperm count's low. I just found a prolactinoma. You know, I just saved you, you know, but even smoking, I mean, stop smoking. And so when someone stops smoking and then they have a kid, I know they're going to stop longer, right? Because they have a kid. They're not going to smoke. So I look at it as, you know, when I get the guy who stops smoking and he has a baby and he says, thank you, doc. And I'll say, you know why I'm happy? I'm happy because I just added five years to your life. Because yeah. I look at the big picture, which is what, you know, what's this guy doing? What's going on? So when I look at an infertile man, I look at what's going on with this guy. General health, infertility, what's going on? What's his story? We have to tell his story. And they okay. deserve it. So you know what I add in here? Sometimes we see guys that are smokers in their sperm um, and they still look normal and say, crap, I want to tell them to stop smoking. What do you say to that? They see normal parameters. And oh, good smoke. luck with that. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, it doesn't work like that. They, they, they just, you know, they've got sperm, right? So what do you need? And so usually my response is do it for her. So she can, you know, because they'll do it for their loved ones, but they Sometimes. won't do it for themselves. Um, threatening that, you know, smoking in their lifespan isn't going to help. But the other way to do it is like, why, sh 
how do you know it's causing a problem? I would order a DNA fragmentation rate. So if the semen analysis looks okay and he's smoking and the DNA fragmentation rate's high, I said, here's your number. Okay. You're making it very hard to conceive naturally and very hard to conceive with low tech things like IUI or turkey basting by having that, by smoking. If you stop smoking, that rate will go down and you might be able to conceive with less expense. And there's your argument. It's gonna cost me a lot less to conceive if I, well, if I stop. And you know what, like for the most part, it does match up that way, but I'm thinking specifically over this one couple. And I'm like, okay, it's him. If I smoke two cigarettes a day and his DNA fragmentation test and it's still normal, and I'm like, there's still something in there, I know it. Yeah. So I, I he won't quit. It's not the whole story. It's it's yeah. complicated. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll get her to watch it then. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again for being here. Thank you all for uh, watching and watching the episode. And please scroll down below for more information on the other live um, fertility talks. And next week we'll have another one, of course, next Wednesday, um, 30 p.m. your time. And if you haven't picked up my book, I do talk about all factors while it happens to pregnancy. And by the way, Paul Turk here actually endorsed my book and did a little review. So that's awesome. And um, that's it. So thank you again, Dr. Turk. Absolutely. And thank you, Mary. You, you do good work. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it's the, our way of giving back to all the people that deserve it, right? Because I've been yep. there, I know. Well, I see you in Vancouver in April. Totally, of course. Oh, good. Yeah. I one of these days I'll actually talk, but I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Take and care. again, everyone guys, check it out next week. Um if like this page and also go to Dr. Turk's um the clinic.com. Check out all the articles. He certainly made lots of content. Lots of content. Ten years of blogs. It's awesome. And I've read something. Make me laugh. And I use analogy all the time. I love the tango. Too. Anyway. Takes two to tango. Takes two to tango. Absolutely. Okay, guys. Have a great night. Take care. I know.